in today's masterclass, uh, Mr. Manish uh, Kumar. Manish Ji is the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of the National Skill Development Corporation. Uh, during your four years uh, tenure at NSDC, Manish Ji, you were particularly focused on improving the quality of private sector, delivery of skills across priority sectors and making skills aspirational. Prior to joining NSDC, you worked for the World Bank as the country coordinator and senior institution uh, development economist for water and sanitation program for, in Delhi. You worked for the World Bank in the Middle East and North African countries covering Lebanon, Iraq, and more. You've served in the Indian Administrative Service, occupying various positions in the government of Tripura up to 2011 and you were selected as the Mason Fellow uh, by Harvard University in 2003 for your leadership. You hold a degree in Bachelor's of Technology in Mining Machinery from IIT ISM, Dhanbad, a Master's in Public Administration from Harvard University and a PhD in Public Policy from the George Washington University. Uh, from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. So uh, my, uh, as, as I think we spoke about, uh, Manish Ji, today's intent to, to speak uh, together with you is to know you as a leader. I'm, I'm, I'm so amazed and I'm rather overwhelmed that I'm talking to a leader who has, who's, who's, who's not just at the helm of, uh, of you know, public policy and, and the decision making in the government uh, in India, but you're, you're highly, highly educated. I mean, all a normal a layman Indian citizen would believe that, you know, the uh, government, you don't really expect uh, one, a very, very high international exposure and two, that caliber. So my very first question, Manish Ji, uh, to you would be to please take us through your journey as you started as a young boy. Uh, of 18, 19 years old. Did you see yourself coming to this level and standing where you are today? Thank you, Dipsika. Um, it's a great pleasure to be talking to you. Um, speaking about uh, when I started uh, around 18, 19, and uh, whether I'm where exactly what I, where I wanted to be, uh, I think um, um, I, I didn't start with a prefix mind that I'm going to be so and so. I think I was more interested in, um, in in doing something which is meaningful. So I, I think what's important, what what was important to me then and continues to be important, is do I get a meaning to my life from the work that I do? So that's how I looked at uh, life then, and that's how I look at life today. And I think that's how I look at it in future too. Um, as 18, 19, I I, I think I remember uh, I was um, a student leader uh, early early on. And I was student leader for a very interesting reason. I was not really interested in student politics, but there were two warring factions and they had intense rivalry and they found me to be the candidate which both sides trusted. So therefore, that, that I think was the first experience which, uh, which I had on leadership, essentially about persuading so that people don't really get, get into fights, uh, but also creating trust that uh, they, they therefore decide to you take the responsibility and I took it. And uh, there was no election that year uh, for, the, for the post of general secretary. Uh, I was unanimous candidate. So I think I had that first experience of leadership at that point in, 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 in a very concrete terms. And the next one year, I was the general secretary of the student union. Uh, the interesting thing is, I think that shaped many of my thoughts uh, because I, I realized that in serving others, I, I would derive a lot of personal satisfaction. That, that had always been there, but I think this was the time when I could feel it more. And therefore, I think in the, in the, in the long run, when I decided I'm going to switch to civil service, I think that was the motivation. And that, that was like um, the, the, the spark, which, which made me feel that this is what I will really enjoy. And therefore, uh, I happened to give civil service. I was uh, a good student generally, so on the very first chance I got, got through. And I ended up in Tripura. Now, Tripura is one of the most difficult states uh, in 1990s, the early 1990s. And within Tripura, the most difficult place was where I got posted. Usually, people run away from there. And I decided to, to dig my hills and stay. So uh, it was, the, the, the issue out there was of insurgency, a uh, high level of insurgency. And it was so bad that there would not be uh, much traffic on that road, perhaps just one bus which would travel uh, with uh, police escort both on the front and the back. 
and the, the police police would not come out of the police station. It was really that dangerous. <laughs> so my job was to put it in order and uh, win the people's trust and actually get back to normalcy. And uh, I initially, obviously, I was taken aback because I was not really expecting that difficult a uh, situation. Uh, I thought life will be cooler, but. Uh, uh, I actually decided to dig my heels there. Uh, and and uh, the way I think I provided leadership was more by example um, and also by very open communication and being very authentic. So you, you, you have to be uh, fair and authentic. I think that's very critical. People will have differing views and uh, societies have problems. I treated violence as a kind of communication that people are upset about something and therefore violence is like Somebody is not listening, perhaps. That's why they're getting violent. So can, can we listen? And then, obviously, there's the issue of law and order. And you, you have to maintain that, too. So you have to be tough for that. So it's a combination of both of it. And eventually, in about one and a half year, when I left that place, you could actually move around that place. I mean, it had become peaceful. And today, if you go to that place, it's, it's, I mean, you don't have any security fears, nothing. Of course, there are lots of other things which go into changing any place uh, but i think creating that initial confidence is quite important and uh, th that two two years which i spent there too i think shaped me in many ways uh, and i continued uh, in that journey uh, eventually uh, working in some remote parts of tripura uh, my focus was actually on women empowerment in tripura quite heavily towards the second half of my um, career out there um, and uh, i think it was that which got me attention from uh, the Kennedy School in US and I ended up getting the Masson Fellow um, uh, uh, admission in the, in, the, in the Harvard University I went on to study. So I think broadly speaking, it's, it's been a combination of um, that inner drive. Uh, I think my approach which uh, has been about communicating very openly, being very uh, receptive to ideas, um, uh, not not getting too emotional uh, or fearful about you know things uh, you i think you have to use your emotion positively so it's not that the emotions don't come to you but you have to use it in a constructive way rather than let it destroy you by by making you very angry so even anger can actually be managed in such a way that you win people uh, by the authenticity of your anger than by getting completely lost in your anger you know which, which is seen as somebody who just lost himself so i think uh, managing yourself in a way that uh, exudes um, or creates confidence in others, I think that that, that has been uh, quite important. And uh, I think uh, finally, as I said, uh, you must enjoy what you are doing. You must feel deeply from within that this this is something which you love, and uh, you you would be happy to be doing that. Uh, you, you would enjoy doing it till your last day. So that, I think that that feeling is quite important. And I think I had it all along. And uh, public service in that sense uh, really, really was uh, very dear and close to me, to my heart, and continues to remain so. So, Dr. Kumar, uh, one, 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 one specific question. I mean, a lot of when we talk about, you know, especially in the recent past, there's been so much conversation about bureaucracy and, and with the government, and then the entire functioning is dependent on bureaucracy and how bureaucracy moves. Uh, and because that's where execution happens. You know, and visioning is one thing, but if execution is not, then vision can do anything. So, what do, you, what do you think? And, you know, I, I, I meet so many uh, leaders in, in similar capacity, especially in the civil services side. And a lot of them feel, feel very claustrophobic. Uh, especially, you know, somebody coming off of pedigree like yours. Uh, there, there are a lot of a lot of these bureaucrats who feel extremely claustrophobic in the sense that they, they come with, you know, to do good, to be over communicate, to, to communicate and, you know, be transparent and all that. But at some level, neither system allows it, nor people expect it. So how do you, how did you balance that through your journey? So Abhi, agar, if there are more bureaucrats coming in or the younger lot, the next card are coming in, what would you tell them to do? to live through the system and excel. Yes, so I actually did not live through the system, by the way. So, <laughs> but, I, but I have a view on this. Uh, it's, it's very correct that uh, there is uh, um, actually uh, quite, quite a lot of extremely good people in civil service, in bureaucracy. And uh, I, I'm, I've got plenty of friends who are, I mean, 
among the best that I've seen in the world, and I've seen quite a bit. And I can say that they're really good, both intellectually and as human beings. But I think the institutional constraint comes in. And uh, the institutional constraints are for several reasons, I think. And it requires addressing by, not just by bureaucrats, but also by politicians. Uh, the first thing is that if you look at India as a country, uh, we are both a country and a continent. We are 1.4 billion people, which is 40 countries in Africa. They add up to 1.4 billion. So we are huge. And then we are unlike other countries, for example, US, you, know, you, have a, you have one language, right? I mean, one language or two at the most, Spanish and uh, English, and it's mostly English which drives uh, US. And, uh, and therefore, when you, when you want to standardize that kind of a country, it's easy. You, to, to organize any society, you require what you, what you technically call the common cognitive belief system, essentially implying that when I use a word, when I use a word, and when you interpret that, you get exactly the same meaning which I'm trying to explain to you. So this, this is something which is extremely tough in India. And I've seen at times that government of India has issued an order in English in Delhi. And by the time it reaches Tripura in the lowest guy out there in the land revenue system, he is actually interpreting exactly the reverse because it has gone into so many uh, you know, layers through which it has gone. And, uh, and, and that's his uh, you know, meaning out of it. So I think one of the challenges, uh, I'll give you an ex interesting anecdote. I remember one person being suspended because he told his boss that your advice was invaluable. Now, the, the, that's supposed to be a, definitely a very plus thing, right? I mean, you are basically praising him, but the boss was extremely upset and he said, invaluable, you're saying that I'm useless. And because before valuable, he put in. Therefore, he, he couldn't. And in his cognitive system, belief system, it was a negative word. And he wrote it in the file and he actually suspended him. And later when we were reviewing, we were surprised. I mean, he was praising you all this while, you couldn't get it. So, so I think this creating this common belief system is a very, very tough thing in India. And uh, I think that's, that's one, of, one of the reasons why uh, people flounder. Institutions were meant for stability of India by the Britishers. It is not meant for growth, uh, the institutions. And I think we have not been able to change our institution very fast. Uh, I have studied the range of institutions. So at one end is Mexico, at the other end is India, by the way. So India, you get people from bureaucracy who are highly intelligent, come to a system and, uh, and, uh, and follow a rule, a rules and regulation and therefore you know, start the journey in a very, very positive way. Mexico, the other end, uh, which uh, I learned, uh, you know, to, during my studies, is is basically a spoil system that I come as a minister and I bring everybody who is my friend, my uncle, everybody into the ministry, and that's perfectly okay in the in the system at that particular point of time. And then uh, what happens is in India, when you want to change rules, uh, it is far much more difficult than if you wanted to change a rule in Mexico because Mexico, everybody has the same. Uh, goal and they belong to one unit, right? And therefore, they quickly change it. If uh, the top man says, "Let's change this," everybody falls, falls in line. In India, that doesn't happen, and uh, uh, I think that that's one of the uh, you know the other extreme where perhaps there'll be a resistance to change because the system is used to working in a particular way. I think it's the middle ground. You know, some some of the countries like New Zealand, Australia, USA, etc., represent the middle ground where there is a uh, flexibility also, and there is a certain level of rigidity also. I think that's where we need to go uh, in long term, uh, institutionally. But I, I don't think so we have been able to move that needle, because I think the challenge in a country like India, as I said, is uh, that is is you are struggling with so many things. Uh, so you're trying to fix an aeroplane while while it's flying, right? I mean, you can't uh, say that uh, let's stop the aeroplane and then we fix it and we'll fly uh, from here onwards. So. So that's, I think, the biggest challenge. That is a moving machine. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody has figured out how do you keep on changing it incrementally that eventually uh, it becomes more efficient. But I think overall, the directions uh, lately uh, has been on the positive side. I mean, uh, over the you know, last uh, several years now. And I, I, I get a feeling that uh, we, we will be... Uh, lots of rules that you'll notice are long term. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. The GST. Is something which is long term. I mean, there might be difficulties which people face today, but it has huge long term impact. Aadhaar was one of uh, such things. National education policy is again very positive. Uh, you know the way it is crafted. 
So a lot of things which have been coming lately uh, has been on the, uh, on the positive side and will have long-term positive consequences. Um, so far as I'm concerned, I lived within the institution. I enjoyed it. But, but I believe in service, not as a noun, but as a verb. So to me, the action is more important. And I actually honestly believe that everybody does public service if they want to. You are doing one by being a good communicator, by ensuring that you know, the, the people get, get messages that they need to get, right? So therefore, even that's a huge public service, which, uh, which, which we cannot uh, underplay. And I think everybody can be, be a very powerful public service player, but people often take ego position, you know, and then if I get lost that, oh, I just want to be in this position, uh, the, the, the verb is not important, the noun is important, then there's a problem. And I think that's, that's where some of our malaise lies. So personally, I believe that we should be far much more mobile. Um, bureaucracy, I, I think, is brilliant, but I think there is a need for bureaucracy to be moving out. Uh, the reason why they need to move out is you must push yourself out of your comfort zone if you really want to learn. And, uh, and when you, I have been in that comfort zone, so I know, I mean, it really looks fabulous. But I pushed myself out because I knew that if I'm going to be here, I'll never learn. So you need to push yourself out of your comfort zone, go out, learn. And I think it should be made institutional that everybody after 10 years of service is forced to go out for five years, seven years, go and work in private sector, go and work in NGO, go and work any damn place you like, and then come back if you are still wanting to come back and serve the country again. Uh, and this whole idea of lateral move, but people are coming laterally into service, is a good idea, I think, you know, and it brings fresh perspective. Um, it uh, obviously the uh, bureaucracy will be a strong challenge. I mean, they're very capable, very capable. They, they, they can actually put up a tough fight to anybody who come who comes from outside. But then it does bring a new perspective, and it's quite important uh, to to have that. So broadly, my thoughts on this issue. Lovely, both positively, and I was I was actually wanting to stop you there and say that. Achha, ab personally, kya kare? So institutionally, so but I think you alluded to that. So that was wonderful. Now my next question, you know, which which, which kind of talks about your journey again, you know, from Tripura to to X to Y to now to NSDC. How do you learn so quickly? You know, what is your mantra of you know changing? Because your job is not easy, right? I mean, you're sitting right at the top. You have to take some very very tough decisions, which need to be based on both facts as well as experience. How do leaders like yourselves? take such quick decisions and with limited set of facts. What do you do to build that knowledge? Yeah, so I, I think a uh, few things which I, I, which I do. One is you learn from experience, obviously. You talk to a lot of people. You, know, you, you need to be communicating to all your stakeholders. You, you have to be very conscious that there are people who will oppose your views. And it's very important for that people actually oppose your views. So in my office, I, I, I actually tell people quite openly that if you don't really reply me back sometimes, then I would actually think you're not really adding value to me because it's important for you to differ. You can't just think like me because there was the point hiding you if you think exactly like me. So I would have thought exactly that way. So I think one is uh, how, do you, how do you ensure that multiple viewpoints come in, people differ with you, you are flexible enough that somebody tells you something logically and you, 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 are, you don't take it as an ego position that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm your boss, therefore I must be right all the time. You, you should be able to change and you should not be afraid of saying that, uh, you know, uh, that there was a need uh, that I, I should have reflected on this particular issue. So I think one is learning from people themselves around you, uh, and, uh, which, which means people above you, people below you, people who differ with you, people who are think similar to you. Uh, that, that dialogue is very important. Second, I think my best friends are my books. Uh, so I spend a lot of time in reading, regardless of how busy I am, actually. I spend time on books. I read quite a bit. Uh, and I read very diverse. Uh, so and, and that's been how I, how I was, I think, from the beginning, that I, I simply love ideas. And I engage in them. I read them. And I, I think I forget. But many times I realize that, well, I actually end up keeping many of it subconsciously. And it comes to use, uh, you know, at some point of time, and I suddenly recall, okay, this this is the kind of framework which was there. So I think this is one, and uh, I think the th third way, which uh, I would say uh, I learn is, time to time, I actually take breaks to learn. So, for example, 
when I was in civil service for almost 12 years, I was very seriously concerned that my ability to grasp was going down. My attention span was decreasing. Uh, and uh, I could see a lot of, uh, lot of changes in me, which I was not happy about. So therefore, I took a break, uh, I went for studies and spent one year uh, you know, studying, etc. And then I enjoyed it. So therefore, I continued both working as well as doing my PhD thereafter. And uh, that got me deeper. Uh, one thing which one has to be cautious about is, uh, and the, you know, that as you study, uh, not to get too proud about knowledge, because the more you study, more you, you realize how ignorant you are. In fact, you are most confident when you have only half the knowledge. Then you're extremely confident because you just don't know that uh, there is something which is beyond it. So, <laughs> so I think well, one of the, the challenges for anybody is to, is to remember that, you see, this world is far too big and far too complex for anybody to be having all the knowledge in his head and therefore not, not being too proud about knowledge, being humble about it, uh, but always striving to get as much as possible into you and respecting everybody, uh, regardless of you know, how, much, how much education they might have taken or not taken. I have actually learned quite a bit you know, from, very, from people who are relatively not formally educated. Uh, you know, when I was in Tripura and all these places, I interacted hugely with uh, people who were who had never been to formal schools, but the kind of intellect they had, the kind of experience they had, they teach you. I mean, and then you have to be open for that. So I think that's how I learned. I think I keep myself open. I also push myself out of my comfort zone frequently. I take my breaks uh, when I have to, when I feel that I must sit down and now, uh, you know, spend a year uh, where, where I re recalibrate my thought processes. And, uh, and then when I'm back, I give myself fully to whatever job I might have taken. So uh, I remember in the World Bank, I worked very heavily on sanitation, um, the, which is pre swachh Bharat. So a lot of background work uh, that, was, that would have helped actually execute policies uh, was there already in the, in the World Bank because of a lot of hard work done by some of us, which includes me, but there are lots of other colleagues too. And uh, thereafter, I think uh, now I'm in skills and... Uh, I have enjoyed my time. I think learned a little bit, and uh, um, yeah. So next, next I do. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be doing definitely things which uh, interest me and uh, which essentially would imply things that benefit people at large at scale. That's wonderful. So I will come to the skills part as well as the, as one of my very last questions. But I have one more question as a leader that I wanted to talk uh, talk to you about. So you know, uh, Dr. Kumar, like. Uh, 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 like I said, you know, I have I've, I've seen and, and, and we see, uh, you know, administrative officers or, 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 or leaders from the government system or the, the public policy system. But there is one big differentiator that I've seen in you, which is one is if, if I can use massively uh, credible image. And two is huge amount of trust that you've generated. And you know, it's not just the skilling part that I'm talking about, the people who work with you, the people who are probably looking forward to working with you. The entire ecosystem is extremely positive about you. How do you make sure, or what has your conscious contribution been? Uh, I, I know I'm sure a lot of it is uh, subconscious and just by virtue of who you are, but what has been your conscious contribution to, to make uh, or, or give that comfort to people who uh, are around you? I think it's important to, to be fair. Uh, fair, And uh, you could be wrong. I mean, I can be wrong, honestly. It's not that every decision I take is right. But I think every decision that I take uh, is done with fairness. That is there very deeply. And uh, anybody comes and challenges me, I'll always have arguments on why, it, why I consider it fair. And usually the person goes satisfied that, yeah, this, this looks very fair uh, to, have, to have been done that way. So uh, I think fairness is a very, very important part of any leadership uh, that, you, uh, that you take up. Uh, I think that is one important part. Um, secondly, I think uh, uh, probably the need for communicating and the, the need for communicating in a way that it, it provides a, a view of the future. Uh, provides a view of where you are heading. Uh, what is that meaning that is coming out of your life? So let's say uh, I'm spending my time doing skilling. Now, uh, I, I actually told uh, some of my staff in a, a written email once that for every one hour that they worked, they made, the, they made a difference 
in the life of seven people in India. So therefore, essentially I was telling them that please don't waste your time because every <laughs> one hour you waste, there are seven people whose lives may not change because you, you didn't work hard enough. So, uh, so I, essentially, how do you communicate, you know, and how do you create that meaning, which ensures that the person sees it as something very personal, you know, something which, uh, which motivates him uh, because, because it's creating meaning to his life. I think that's important, uh, how you communicate. And, um, you know, the, the moment when you communicate, uh, sometimes I, I, I think, you know, communication, particularly written communication in India can be quite difficult. You know, it's not so direct. And uh, people can um, often write a very lindy email, which may, means very little. So I think working on your communication, that it ensures is very precise, uh, it is personal, it is non-technical, even not required and technical when it is required. I think those are the co communication part has to be taken very seriously, I would say. So these two things, fair, being fair and communicating rightly, they, these two I think are critical. Great, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you would want to add as a leader? What would you, what would be the final, say, maybe three messages that you would want to give uh, to an aspiring leader? both from a corporate and, and uh, public policy perspective that they could do and take away from your life? So, I mean, personally, I would say that never confuse a manager and a leader. Uh, these are two different things. A leader doesn't require any power behind him. He simply believes in what he is doing. And therefore, he will do regardless of whether he has power or doesn't have power. It doesn't matter to him because he believes in that. So I think how driven are you? That's, I think, the, the very important part. A lot of people actually wait for power and they think that, okay, when you get power, then you're a leader. There, there, there's no relationship between power and leader. You can have a lot of power and be just a manager. You're just ticking up boxes and not really providing leadership. So I think this differentiation, understanding this differentiation and checking within yourself that are you having the drive or not? And say, let's say that you don't have it. Then I think it's very important that you look for meaning in your life. That what is it which really makes you crazy about, right? I mean, is there something... That, that makes you feel very strongly about uh, contributing. And make that your passion. I mean, you should, that's what you should be doing because then the leadership automatically comes. You, you would automatically get involved in those issues. I think that's uh, the second part. And third is, I think, uh, you know, when you interact with people, um, win the trust of people. And win the trust of people doesn't mean that you have to always agree. But I think they need to see uh, you as somebody who cares, who is empathetic, regardless of, he being your friend or not being your friend, regardless of he having a view which is completely opposite. But you are empathetic because your difference is not, not one of person. It is one of views. And it's, it's, you know, it's the path that you are taking, which you have a strong logic for, and he, perhaps, perhaps uh, he or she uh, might have a different one. So I think these two, three things make a huge difference. Excellent. I've, I've never thought about it like that. You know, a manager and a leader are two different things. And... How often do we confuse it? All, almost always. Always. <laughs> so, Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So, Dr. Kumar, that takes me to my last section on, uh, you know, your current role. Uh, the NEP has just come out. And you manage, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not wrong, 37 different sectors are under NSTC. Yes. Yeah. What is your vision for, uh, you know, moving? And, I, and, and as we see, of course, you know, from the college, the school education to the higher education to now the corporate world, etc. And the entire gamut is now moving to the online learning format. What is your vision and view of the speed of execution and the level of maturity that you see across these 37 sectors? And which would be the sectors, according to you, would be the most promising uh, in terms of adoption of e-learning? Yeah, so I think, you know, when I answered this question, for reasons that I said before, that India is both a country and a continent, I like to decompose uh, India. And uh, what I find is I usually do it using income quartiles. So if you look at, you know, the India, the lowest income quartile, uh, the lowest 25% of India, uh, they have an income of 26,000 rupees per month or less. The next income quartile, that's between 25 and 50, they have between 26,000 to 37,000 per month. That's, that's what they earn. The next income quartile earns between 37,000 to 57,000. That's the 25% to 75% um, of India. And anybody who earns more than 57,000 is actually the top 25% of India's income quartile. So that's what India is. 
anybody who earns more than 88,000 rupees per month actually earned is the top 10% of India's income per uh, side. So it's, I think when you look at, the, look at the problem from this perspective, suddenly you'll find you know, that when digital comes, whom is it going to really benefit unless we are conscious that there are you know, people who perhaps need it the most, but will never get it. Uh, so therefore you have to create space for that. So, so digital, therefore, you know, it's good to talk about AI, good to talk about IoT, et cetera. But as I mentioned, there's the top 10%, right? 88,000 per month and above. These are the people who actually will benefit from AI, from IoT and others as subjects which they learn and get jobs. And there'll be plenty of people who will do that and get jobs. But I think our, our real challenge would be that, can we take this digital revolution down below? Is it possible for us uh, to take it to uh, the lowest income quartile? And it's possible in reality. So I think a uh, few of the things which we have done, you know, is uh, if you look, go to eSkill India platform, a lot of digital skilling that we do is not done in just one language, not just English. It's actually done in nine different languages. So even if somebody is, let's say, in the uh, lowest 25 percentage of India's income, um, and is not, uh, let's say, not, not had chance to actually go to English school and learn English. And therefore, you know, the difficulty of not being able to access regular uh, academic staff, uh, the, the eSkill India platform actually provides you that opportunity. You, you could listen in your local language, learn in your local language, you know. And I think we, we want to create more and more of such digital uh, potential uh, where, where it's hitting right at the bottom. Secondly, I think few things which will happen, and I, I'm actually quite impressed at the speed at, at which it's happening, is even some of the very traditional roles, for example, carpentry, which you normally would associate you know, with uh, somebody taking a saw and cutting. I have seen young boys from uh, remote areas of Rajasthan working in uh, uh, institutions set up by Narsi. Um, you know, he's a famous, um, carp uh, basically a woodwork person. Uh, and uh, in, the in the outskirts of Mumbai, it's a big factory. And what they essentially have is the traditional carpenters, uh, young boys who have been trained. They're not very educated, but they have been trained. They have been trained on what? On how to manage computers that are linked to robots, which actually do the real cutting. So, so lots, of, lots of, let's say, wood actually being lifted, being given shape through automatic machines. But the computer entry is being done by these boys uh, who are not highly educated. I mean, they, they might not even know much of English, but they're able to operate that computer, which I can't, honestly. And uh, therefore, it's actually changing, you know, the way uh, the world uh, you know, is operating. Secondly, I've seen, for example, the, you know, you, we talk of driverless cars in California. Now, these driverless cars, um, you know, as I often mention, are often driven by data, which is given by uh, which is provided by girls from Bhumneshwar and uh, 24 Paganas in West Bengal, uh, who are trained by some of our partners. And essentially, you know, the, the fact that they, they were trained from rural parts of uh, Odisha, bought to Bhumneshwar and provided jobs, uh, young uh, children, you know, with just maybe class 10, 12 pass and earning good money uh, through that. So it's, it's the power of the digital technology which is enabling that. And all that they're doing is sitting in front of a computer, uh, looking at some street, picture of some street from California, which comes into the screen. And they tag on that. They have been taught how to tag. There's the median of the road. There is a lamppost on the left. There might, there's the curve of the road. Uh, they just keep on tagging that for 10 minutes and then push that up, up to, if there's a 35 miles per hour, they will write that. And then they send it off to the cloud. It goes up and then another picture comes. And the 100 girls who are sitting and doing that uh, day and night, and they are very happy with the money that they get doing this kind of work. Now, essentially, some car then come and drives in California. They are picking up this kind of data, converting that into machine intelligence. You know, So the intelligence of a girl uh, from uh, the lowest income quartile uh, from Bhubaneswar or outskirts of Bhubaneswar is actually helping move cars in California. So I think we need those kind of jobs, which are interlinked to India's prosperity from the bottom. In addition to, of course, the IoT and AI and virtual reality and augmented reality, which we all speak of and we understand they are important. And 
Uh, on, on the top side, what I've found is recent interest in Japan, huge interest, uh, that they want AI, artificial intelligence uh, experts from India uh, to be working in Japan. You see, aging population, they have to depend quite a bit on robotics. So therefore, how do we uh, ensure that there is a flow that, that it can be enabled? So we have got some uh, 30 different uh, organizations, support organizations, uh, through which we are now planning. And uh, we had a webinar on 6th of August uh, this, this year, uh, where the Japanese participated and they explained their interest in taking AI experts from India. Uh, Japanese language, we noticed, uh, can be learned by Indians in about six to nine months. Now, if you are from Tamil Nadu, you pick it up very fast. Really? This, this surprised us. <laughs> so you pick it up fast because apparently the structure of Tamil language and the structure of Japanese language are very similar. So therefore it comes very naturally. And, uh, and, uh, and people, I've seen uh, Tamil children speaking Japanese in uh, Japan and they were so fluent that the Japanese clapped and you know, they were so happy about it. So I think we, have, we are talented. Uh, in any case, we speak multiple languages. Uh, I think um, we, are, we, we are willing to learn uh, as, as, uh, you know, as a population. Uh, and uh, generally, I think uh, Indians are well regarded for their behavior. Uh, we, we have some natural soft skills and some others need to be built. Uh, we work on that. So I think uh, uh, overall, um, it's, it's been, I mean, very enjoyable on this front. So one leading question, you know, the, the, for example, the sectoral bit that you were talking about and the distribution that you spoke about. So what would be the primary use cases, uh, Dr. Kumar, that you see in these, uh, in India emerging? I mean, where do you think the online learning part would become most relevant? You talked of carpentry, you, you talked about data uh, management. But but आपके हिसाब से मतलब कौन से तीन areas ऐसे रहेंगे जहाँ पे आपको लगता है कि use cases online learning के बहुत ज़्यादा build होने वाले हैं? Is it is it in terms of service orientation? It could be sales. It could be uh, I don't know technical skills. What 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 do, what is your sense? So I think uh, we we perhaps don't know enough honestly. So like I will tell you how things are, seem to be evolving at the moment and how fast it is evolving. Sometimes people are not able to keep track of that. Um, uh, one of our partner was telling me that a lot of things that we do um, in our web browser would actually be going into a sound system, right? I mean, we'll basically be asking the browser to open rather than opening the browser. Mm-hmm. Already we are talking to Alexa, uh, many of us. So I think the, the future is getting towards voice data and uh, using that voice data. Now in that, there are two, three languages which apparently will be extremely popular and where perhaps the growth will be very fast. So they say that the, uh, the highest obviously is English. That's where a lot of data, voice data will be used. But second is Hindi and the third is Tamil again. So, so therefore, uh, there are languages which is going to benefit hugely. Now, when we, I think, get into the, uh, the language part of how we operate internet and the digital world, then I think things will change drastically. So you would have seen a lot of change coming from mobile. Uh, I think the next phenomenal change will come because you are able to talk in your local language, right? I mean, and, and the computer is responding and talking to you back in local language. Mm. Uh, and, and I think those, those are, you know, what, what will be the defining things of the future. Um, as of now, I mean, we, we are all aware that, you know, the uh, data, data science, data analytics, uh, the Internet of Things, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, these are very important topics. And, you know, these are the ones which are trending. Uh, these are, again, as I said, for the, uh, perhaps the, the 88,000 rupee per month and above category who are going to benefit most out of it. Uh, but I think when the, the, the language part comes and which is, you know, occurring quite fast, uh, then I think a large number of people will benefit in a, in a very big way. So, we have to be watching, you know, and I think one of, uh, one of the things that NSDC does is we are constantly watching the market and uh, trying to then through our sector skill councils, draw in that information, create job roles, encourage training partners that can you please begin working on this. And we are aware that some of them are already uh, on it and, uh, you know, working on it. So, so therefore, this knowledge itself becomes important. Absolutely. And it is evolving. So you, you, you think that, you know, from a... To, to put it all together in terms of, you know, the vernacular part would bring the even the lowest 25% uh, 
uh, up into the uh, mainstream and perhaps make them more employable. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, and, and okay. I think increase the chances of employability as well as enhance their skills uh, in a way. Yeah. Fantastic, perfect. Uh, that's roughly about what I had, Manishji, today for the conversation. But it was it was enjoyable. It was thoroughly enjoyable, and I got to know you. Uh, better as a person and uh, that was my biggest takeaway from today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I think one, uh, one aspect of skill which perhaps I keep emphasizing is you know, the fact that skill is a case of market failure. Uh, you know, the private sector doesn't skill people in, uh, and it doesn't do globally. Uh, in general, I'm not saying they don't skill, but I mean in general they have a, they, there is aversion to skill because uh, particularly if you're MSME, because you know that your competitor is going to pose that guy if you have invested a lot of money on, them, on, on that person. So private sector therefore tries to reduce that risk. And uh, that's the reason why globally government actually comes in to invest money into skilling. Uh, however, at some point when the economy grows, you'll find that the private returns become quite high. So when you would have noticed that in the IT uh, world, in uh, you know, the turn of the century when IT was growing very rapidly, then almost all the big uh, companies that we had, uh, they had uh, created their own training centers. And uh, therefore, there is a time when the private sector also begins to take interest. So it's a question of, I think, finding out which sector is growing how, and then ensuring that the, there is a combination of flow of both private and the government money into skilling. And uh, so I think keeping that in mind is important. I actually I want to ask one, one last question after the buy, which is that, which, I, which is what I forgot. What does the future hold for Dr. Kumar? You already studied so much, you read so much, uh, you are uh, beyond the top 0.5% in terms of the education levels that you, you've garnered already. What is the future? What is the next five years for Dr. Kumar? So for me, I think uh, after I end my tenure, I'll have to take one year to unlearn. <laughs> so that's equally important, right? So I think, you know, you, you need to, I think, refresh yourself, re uh, reboot yourself and I, I'm going to take time to reboot myself um, which uh, you know would be more getting into a little bit of academics for a while uh, maybe you know just putting my thoughts together to write a book because I think it's important to write a book which is uh, in a way because skill is going to be important for a long time so if you write a book that's futuristic which gives the thought of today but uh, you know shows uh, where we should be heading in general or how we are heading and what are the challenges I think that will be beneficial to people. So probably I'll spend a year uh, doing that. And then I'll see what, what to do next. <laughs> Wonderful. This is a lovely conversation. It's such an honor uh, to have spoken to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Deepshika. Thank you so much.